We are Troy and Penny Maxwell, the senior pastors of Freedom House Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we want to welcome you to our YouTube channel. That's right. You can catch all of our messages, all of our services. There's incredible worship, and I know God's going to touch it in a powerful way. Absolutely. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube right. channel. Welcome to church this morning. My name is Matt Henderson, and this is my beautiful wife, Diana Henderson. What's up? And we are campus pastors at South End Campus. So you may yes. know her. She's, they let her come up here. They don't let me come up here. Because they like to keep me in my little space where they know how to, I'm just there, and I can't be online because we're online today. And listen, while I'm saying that, North Carolina, shout it out. Yeah, What's we up? got people Florida, joining us. South Carolina, Tennessee, Minnesota, Texas, Pennsylvania, and New York. So welcome, good morning. Welcome. Welcome today, everybody here, everybody that's online. Um, I'm excited to be here. A little bit about us since we're typically not here is that um, we've been coming to Freedom House for about 15 years, and this was our campus yeah. um, before we went multi site. So uh, we love this campus. It's an honor and a privilege and awesome to come back here um, this morning. And then we are typically at the South End campus. Uh, we both work in the in the marketplace. So I'm a general contractor. Diana works in technology, whatever that. He doesn't means. really know what I do, <laughs> but that's okay. That's for another day. And uh, we have three small kids: ten, five, ten. Eight let me get this right: ten, eight, and five. Yeah. They always change, so it's like, where are they right now? Yeah. Ten, eight, and five. One will be 11 soon. I'm just threw me off. Anyway, yeah. 10, 8, and 5, Miles, Cora, and Quinn. And um, we just love this church. Yes. And our family does. They're in FH Kids right now, but they love coming back to Central. The big campus is what the they call campus, it. big campus, yeah. We're going back to big church today. And we love our senior pastors. Can yes. we give it up for Troy and Penny Maxwell? They're so amazing. You know, I like to say that we truly have had a front row seat to our senior pastors for the last 15 years. And I like for people to know we've watched them be consistent. In 15 years, yeah. they've always been consistent on the front line. So they're just amazing. And it's, if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here today. So That's grateful. Right. All right, Let's guys, you ready to get started? Yeah. Okay. So we've been in a series this month called Love, Sex, and Dating. It's a little spicy in this series, right? Have you guys heard some spicy talk spicy. so far? Yeah? Have you learned something? already. Yeah, okay, good. Well, if you're new to Freedom House and the way that we do things, you might be like, why are we talking about these topics from the platform, from the pulpit? Well, here's my take on it. If we are not learning how to do relationships from a biblical perspective, we're gonna default to the way that the world does it. And I don't know about you, but I'm watching that standard change on the daily. Yep. Yesterday, there was a standard. Today, it's a little bit different. Tomorrow, who knows what we can expect, right? And you know, the Bible warned us about that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, see to it. Everybody say, see to it. See to it. That no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ because the worldly standard is ever changing. Has anybody ever played cards with a five-year-old? <laughs> yeah, so you know that a card gets laid down and you're like, oh, I beat you and they're like, no, you didn't. 
They and all of a sudden, the rules change, and you're like, wait a second. They naturally just cheat. I can't win this game. Yeah, they cheat. They figure it out. You're like, I can't win this game. Well, that's how doing relationships the worldly way is. You can't win. You can't be successful. So keep that in mind. It's like playing cards with a five-year-old. So today, we're going to have a conversation all about intimacy, and specifically God's design for physical and emotional intimacy. So we typically describe intimacy from a spatial perspective versus a relational perspective. Think about it. Have you ever said like, oh yeah, I'm really close to that person? Or I have a deep relationship with that person. Or if it's someone you don't know very well, you might say like, oh, we've got like a surface level relationship. But how many of you know intimacy is not spatial, it's relational. Intimacy is relational. In fact, the definition of intimacy is all about being known by someone or knowing someone. It's all about that connection. It's relational. Think about it. Have you ever been on a plane sitting next to somebody that you've never met in your life and you are sitting super close, right? Proximity is like four centimeters like a little too close for comfort. But you don't know that person. But yet you could be deep friends with somebody that lives 4,000 miles away. So intimacy is not spatial, it's relational. Now, there was an elderly couple and they were laying in bed one night and the woman said, you know, when we were young, you used to hold my hand when we were laying in bed. So the Old man crawls his fingers across the sheets and grabs his wife's hand, and she's still not satisfied. Come on, ladies. She said, you know, when we were young, you used to snuggle up close to me. So the old man laboriously, like, bumps his body over across the bed to snuggle up close to his wife, and she's still unsatisfied and goes, you know, when we were young, you used to nibble on my ear. Well, he flips the covers off, gets out of bed, and starts to walk out of the room. And she's like, where are you going? I'm hurt. And he goes, I'm going to get my teeth. (laughs) All right, y'all, buckle up. We're going for an intimate ride today, talking about intimacy through God's view. That's right. So if you're taking notes, um, get your phones out, get a piece of paper. If you're online at home, grab an old piece of mail or something. (laughs) Write down this first point, intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. This is our spiritual intimacy, right? And like Diana said, the intimacy is a, this close familiarity. It's, it's a friendship. It's, um, it's a relationship, a, a definition of closeness with someone. The very first intimacy, intimate relationship of God's design was in the very beginning, and it was with him. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they will rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the skies, over the livestock, the animals, over, all the, over everything. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. So the scriptures are laying it out, how God, you know, man came from God, right? And he came from his own image, in the image of God. And then he goes on further in Genesis 2, verse 18, he says, it is not good for the man to be alone. It's not good right. for this creation that I have made to be alone. And so I will make a, a helper suitable for him, right? And then he creates Eve out of Adam's rib. But in other words, God's laying this out because he's, he's saying, if what I've created is in my image, and if, if it is not good to be alone, it is good to be in relationship, then I am also, we're also meant to be yeah. in relationship with God, right? That's how God is. God's, God's showing meant us, to be in relationship. Right. He's saying, if I created you in my image and you need to be in relationship, then so do I. And I want to be in relationship with you. So um, he's referring to himself. God is saying, I always, we always intended relationship. So this is why in, um, in 2020, the church, our pastor's, um, thank God they took a hard stance on the church being open, yes. right? In the midst of everything going on in the world and everything being shut down and being told what to do, where you can and can't go, um, and the church being one of those that was proposed to or be. Or telling us to stay in our homes. You're right. Isolation was not God's design. Can I get an amen? Right. So God, so our pastors are saying, no, we're going to have the church open. The church needs to be open because we, are need, we need to be in community with each, with each other. We yeah. need to be in relationship. And hindsight, looking back, you know, look at all the mess that isolation has done over the past two yeah. years with suicides on the rise and, 
and addictions and just the crazy emotional state that our world is in right now as a result of being isolated. But here's the thing. Intimacy has no contenders. Intimacy with God has no contenders. And what I mean by that is God, your relationship with God, nothing can come before that. Nobody on this earth can offer you what God can offer you. The promises that God has given to us, to each one of us individually, cannot be fulfilled through another person or another That's good. relationship. That's good. He explains this in Exodus 20, verse 3. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. Little g God. So you can't put anything before me. No, yeah. no desire, no anything in this world, not even your relationship. So my first love is God, not Diana, right? She cannot be my Jesus, right? And in order for me to have a healthy relationship here, I first have to have a relationship here, yeah. right? Because if this one's not good, then this one will suffer. That's right. right. And all the others. And if you're not married, then you're, whoever you're dating, it will suffer. And if you have kids, it, it will, it, your kids, your relationship with your kids will suffer. And if you don't have kids, if you're a dog, then it's going to affect your relationship with your dog, right? Those four-legged babies. All across the board is going to affect. But you have to get right here first. Yeah. And what does intimacy with God look like? Again, it's going back to this closeness. It's a friendship. It's a trust without abandon. Men, this is not intimacy. I know where you're going in your head. It's like we go to the bedroom when you talk about intimacy. It just pops in our head. This is not what we're talking about. This is a closeness, a bond, something that cannot be broken. It is, it is not just a physical um, relationship. And Psalms, the psalmist says it best for me as well. It's, it's Psalm 73, 28. He says, but as for me, it is good to be near God. That's what he's talking about, the intimacy, the near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell all of your deeds. And in this refuge, the word that he used here, it's talking about a place that he can go to be with God, right? We have some of the, some, you can find refuge in, in relationships on, on this earth. When I have something great that happens to me, like I just want to run and tell Diana because I know that even if she doesn't even care about it, she's at least going to act I'm gonna excited celebrate. with me, right? She's going to be excited with me. Or if I have, if something happens to me that um, just has me down in the dumps, right? Something bad happens, I get some bad news. Something doesn't work out my way. I know that I have someone that I can run to and share that with. Maybe it's your mom. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's a coworker, but when something happens, you go to this place and you know that they're not going to judge you for it, they're, but they're going to feel your burden and your pain with that. That's what the psalmist is talking about. Yeah. I have made God my refuge. Mm -hmm. He's the place that I go to, right? And then when you go there and you're with God, it wrecks your world, right? He changes In your whole life. Way, and yeah. you're like, man, look, can I tell you how awesome God is? And you're like the annoying guy over the hanging with your boys watching football and you just keep bringing up your girlfriend, Right? And you're like, bro, she's not even here. And she has nothing to do. She doesn't even like the Panthers. <laughs> Stop talking about her, right? But you're like, man, this is a girl. She's changed my world. And that's how it is for the psalmist. He says, I will tell of all your deeds. Let me tell you about God. Do you know what God did for me? Do you know what God promised me? Do you know what he did for me? you know what he's brought me through? Do you know what I looked like yesterday? Do you know some of the stuff that I've done, but where I am today? You know, there's, I will tell of all your deeds, God. It's like the old song. I don't know if you guys remember it. Let me tell you about my best friend, right? And listen, if you're single, I want to talk to you guys right now, so look at me. If you're single, I'm not trying to, I know relationship conversations, you guys kind of tune out or something, but listen to me. Singleness is God's sovereign plan for you right now, mm. where you are in your life right now. You shouldn't be trying to rush through it. You shouldn't be ashamed of it or think that something's wrong with you yeah. or that why am, I, why am I this age and this, why don't I have, why can't I have something like they have? You shouldn't try to rush through this because, listen to me, you can offer something in your service to the Lord and your relationship with God that no married person can offer. Mom. That no parent can offer. Yep. Because when you're single, you can give God every single thing that you have. Yeah. There's nothing that's being pulled from you. When I'm married, like Diana gets a piece of me, of me right? My kid, I have three kids. Each one of my kids gets a piece of me. If you're single and just running after God, you can give him everything, yeah, right? This is just like Paul. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he did it all while he was single. Yeah. I mean, he even wrote about the, like, he says, if you're going to go after God like me, you should probably be single, right? Because I'm going after <laughs> God like nobody yeah. else has. And if you're not with that, then you can go get married and settle down and have some kids, right? But I'm going after God. So being single affords you this contribution to the kingdom that, kingdom that is richly valuable and unlike any of us who are married. James 4, verse 8 
says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So if you go after him with everything, he's just going to come right beside you and scoot over on that bench and just get right as close to you are as you want to get him. It's a reciprocity, right? Whatever you put in with God, he's going to put out, right? However much you want to chase after God is how much you're going to get back from him. Your intimacy with God will set the tone for the intimacy in any other relationship in your, in your life, whether romantic or not. So good. Okay, so now that we know that first comes our intimacy with God, let's talk about what intimacy looks like in marriage. Now, if you're single, dating, don't tune out because there's something in this for you as well. Matt just said that our intimacy with God sets the tone for all of our other relationships. So let's understand what that looks like in marriage. And first, we got to understand God's design for marriage, right? Now, God's design for marriage, marriage was God's first institution that he gave to mankind. It was the very first one. And he made marriage between a man and a woman, period. End of story. Y'all tracking with me? Okay, now, what's important to understand is that God's design for our marriage was not to make us happy. It was to grow us. It was not to make us happy, but to grow us. I like to say it this way. Marriage is not about making us happy. It's about making us holy. You know, if you think about Matt and I as two pieces of like raw wood, splintery and like rough on the edges, marriage is like some heavy duty sandpaper coming to smooth those edges. Y'all tracking? You know, Matt and I came from very different backgrounds. It was like country boy meets city girl. Our wedding was north meet south. (laughs) It was quite, we still have like debacles from our family about our wedding. It's kind of funny. And then when we got married, I remember one of the first times I cooked for Matt, I made him chili. And he was like, what is this? And I was like, that's chili. What do you mean? What is that? It's chili. And he was like, it's all like chunky and like lots of beans. Anybody from the north? Yeah. Okay. Chili is chunky, right? I got my chunky chili people in here. I was like, how does your chili look? And he shows me, I'm like, that's soup. That's not chili. So like, that's a silly example, but let me give you a legit example. So I grew up halfway across the world in Germany in a military family, and I moved basically like every 12 months. And I saw my extended family twice a year. Matt grew up on a 15 acre compound with all his extended family, like right there up in his stuff. Like, can you imagine those two different backgrounds, you smush them together? Like, that makes for a little bit of conflict, right? So where are we going to live? How are we going to do life? It created conflict. But growth in marriage has one sure path, and it's through conflict. That conflict is what grows us, which shapes us, and what models us more into what God had in mind to be like him. Now, a few other things that God says about marriage. We already talked about he created marriage as a loyal partnership between a man and a woman. I don't need to read that scripture. We covered it. He also intended marriage to be the foundation by which families are created. In other words, God did not design men to have babies. God designed a man and a woman together and to multiply. He says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 7, as for you... Be fruitful and multiply, increase in number, and increase upon the earth. Our God designed marriage to mirror that of his relationship with us. If you read the Bible where Jesus describes himself as the bridegroom and the church as his bride, and then the, that heaven is the great wedding feast, it was designed to mirror God. Now, Do we understand marriage now? That's God's design. Like we we got it all on the same page. All right, now let's talk about intimacy in marriage. God designed sexual expression within the confines of marriage to teach married couples how to experience that intimacy. That's what sex in marriage is all about. But we have to be so careful, so careful not to allow Sex that doesn't exist within the confines of marriage because the Bible says it's like no other sin. Pornography, premarital sex, adultery, 
that there's no place for that. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, so run away from sexual sin. It involves the body in a way that no other sin does. So if you commit sexual sin, you're sinning against your own body. Think about that. And our body was designed to be a temple for the Holy Spirit, right? For the Holy Spirit to dwell. Now, I love this part. God paid a high price to make you his. So honor God with your body. Sex was designed to be within marriage. Now, God's design for that sexual intimacy or intimacy in marriage is summed up in this scripture. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. In other words, God's design for marriage is naked and unashamed. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, this nakedness, we'll talk about a little bit more. It's not just a physical, but it's basically a a completely stripped down emotional and physical connection with someone. Now, women describe intimacy a little bit different. We spell it T-A-L-K. And men spell intimacy S-E-X. So, let's talk about sex, baby. That's right. Time to get uncomfortable up in here. Start shifting around in your seats. The third point that we're talking about today is uh, physical intimacy. Physical intimacy or sex. So this, like Diana was saying, is meant for those who are operating inside the confines of a marriage. Because when it's operated in there inside of a marriage, it's like the most powerful thing ever. Right, married couples? Yes. Do we have married couples in here? (laughs) Are y'all having sex? Fellas, I know y'all are like there with me. Come on, at least. Okay, Okay. just check. Come on. All right, so, but we've kind of gotten this... um, the, the world, the culture of the world is kind of intertwined or mixed up intimacy and sex, right? They've kind of tangled it all up in mm-hmm. each other, right? And if it's kind of one and the same in, in the eyes of the world. And I think for me, where I learned that initially was through music, mm-hmm. right? Being, I did come from the country, and I'm a country boy from d- deep in the holler, as they say, right? But I love, my dad had me listen to music, some love music from before my time. It started with like the Temptations and Earth, Wind, and Fire and songs that were about love, man. Like just men pouring out their heart for the women that they were singing for, right? Back when they had one microphone and like six guys singing. Not everybody needed a mic, but they would all come back together, that one mic, man, to hit that chorus. And it was powerful, right? And it was about love. And uh, then it kind of, you know, into my generation when I started R&B kind of transitioned to, you know, Boys to Men and 112 and All for One. Still, like, great songs, right? Yeah. Great songs about love and just, you know, pouring out their hearts to these women. And then it kind of flipped the switch really quick, right? And it went from Boys to Men to, like, Genuine and Key Sweat. And it's like, <laughs> whoo! Well, I was hearing about stuff. I didn't even know what I was talking about, you know? Nine or ten years old. I'm like, man, what is this dude <laughs> And uh, songs that after you listen to them, you're like, dude, I need a cigarette after that. What's going on, right? And then now today, I'm totally tuned out. So that's kind of where I stopped. So today, I have no idea what's going on. But from what I hear, it's like you listen, you need to fast and pray after, (laughs) after you listen to some of this stuff, right? But even though there's a connect, my point is, even there's this this connection with with intimacy and sex, they're not interchangeable, right? And we don't need to have sex to be intimate with somebody, right? Remember, intimacy is this closeness, it's a bond. I don't need to have sex with someone to be intimate with them. And unfortunately, in the eyes of the world, you don't need to be intimate with someone in order to have sex with them, right? Unfortunately, right? Really, and you could go out, people are having sex today, and they probably don't even, some of them don't even know the name of the other person. So unfortunately, in that aspect, they've got it all jacked up, yeah. right? Because like we were saying, when God his intentions for it to be within a marriage. And when, when it's within a marriage, it builds the marriage and it builds the relationship. It doesn't tear it apart. And it's a very, very powerful thing. Genesis 2, 24 and 25 says, this is why man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame, right? Like Pastor Diana said, naked and unashamed. And then sin came into the world and now it's all jacked up, right? And, and men and women are kind of, different in those areas nowadays and men are typically more um, physically intimate right and women kind of lean towards emotional intimacy would you agree with that not saying it's a one size fits all but in general men are men will lean to that physical side and women will lean to the emotional side 
And my, the best way to explain this, I would think, is uh, picture the locker room. I've never been in a female's locker room. Good job. I've never been in there. <laughs> but I know people who have. I know someone who has. And they yeah. tell me how it's like in there. Women are fairly conservative, right? We're modest. Modest. Yeah. They're, they're covered from head to toe, you know, for the most part. They do their thing in their own little cube or whatever you call them. you got your stalls that you do your showers and stuff with, and you kind of keep to yourself. However, in a men's locker room, it is a free-for-all. <laughs> there are no walls. There's no privacy. No stalls. No stalls, no walls, and it's just all out in the open. And it seems to me, this is only my opinion, don't judge me for this, but as you age, the older you get, the more free you are. And 60, 70 years old, it's like, you know, it's just something that you just stand out with your hands on your hips, right? Having conversations with a man. Did you see Bitcoin went up? I missed out on it, but you know, like nothing's going on. Men, is that true? Yeah? No? Yeah? <laughs> Listen, so He's we're in different. a different locker room. Get, yeah. I was at the YMCA. You go to the YMCA, I guarantee you that's what you're going to run into. Do not go in there. Just what, yeah, Just you better know be careful. Just know what to expect. Eyes down to the ground, looking at the floor. <laughs> Find your way that way. My point is that we have differences. We're different. And when there's differences, there's conflict, right? Yeah. And when there's conflict, what does that create? Opportunities for growth. Mm -hmm. And... The opportunity for growth in our marriage in this is called a marital duty. It's our marital duty. And 1 Corinthians 7, 3, verse 5, 3 through 5, and uh, the NIV explains this. It says, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. And in the same way, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but he yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer also known as the most unpopular form of fasting amongst married couples, right? But then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So married couples, do you hear that? In the Bible, it says it is your, sex is your marital duty. Amen? Yes. It is your duty to get some... Love. Some love. Some love. It's yeah. your duty. Y'all tracking? Okay. Listen, the Bible is full of this stuff. We, I'm not, this is not my words. These are, it's read Song of Solomon and, uh, or some of the Proverbs. You'll see Proverbs 5 is another really good one. Verse 18 says, may your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. Come on. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. That's the Bible, y'all. Yeah. Right? Spicy. It is spicy. So in the words of Marvin Gaye, Let's get it on. All right, let's get it on. And we're going to move on to emotional intimacy, number four. Now, we've talked about that scripture where God's design for marriage was to be naked and unashamed. Now, Matt covered the physical aspect of that, but it's also important that we think about what it means to be emotionally naked or vulnerable in our relationship. Now, this is for all. Vulnerability in relationships is the key to that emotional intimacy. It's the key to the connection with that relationship. Now, women like Matt was saying, have more of a tendency to emotional intimacy. Think about it. Like when we're having conversations with our girlfriends, like they go to places that most men probably would never go in a five-minute convo, right? You know, we'll, we'll talk with our fur babies about, you know, the depths of our being or, you know, someone we just met on a bus. Like it happens to me all the time. You know, I always think about the first time that Matt and I started leading life groups at, at Freedom House, and I have a heart for women, and he has a heart for men, and I would come home from life group, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, tonight was amazing. Like, we shared like our, our deep stories from childhood and the trauma that we walked through, and Matt's like, y'all covered all that tonight? I'm like, yeah, what you guys talk about? And he's like, the Bible and football? But we're just wired differently. Now, man, Adam, in the very beginning of time, understood that about us women. He understood that we're more emotionally inclined. That's why the first time he laid eyes on Eve, he didn't try and get her into bed. 
Instead, he uttered the world's first love poem. This is what he said to her in Genesis 2, verse 23. He says, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man because she was taken out of man. So men in the beginning of time understood how women are wired. But listen, emotional intimacy requires that we open up our heart. Some of us have allowed for walls to build up that prevent that connection. Now, this goes for men and for women. And if I can just be vulnerable, I'll share a little bit of our story. When Matt and I first started dating, I I grew up in a military family like I shared, so I moved all the time, constantly. I had relationships just shifting in and out of my life on the regular. And so when Matt and I started to get close, I broke up with them. Because that makes sense, right? Like, oh, you're the one. Peace out. <laughs> and Matt was like, dude, what's your deal? Like, the, like, we got something going here. Why are you shutting me out? And what I had to realize is that I developed a coping mechanism. That because my world constantly changed growing up, I got really good at goodbye. I got really good at putting up walls that kept people out to protect my heart. But then here's Matt going, I'm the one. And you're building up walls that are keeping you from the person God has in store for you. Y'all, t- y'all hear me on that? So we have to be careful that we're not allowing walls to prevent us from exactly what God has in store. So how do you engage in emotional intimacy? Well, I'm going to give you some practical tips. I'm going to start with the men. Men, where you at? Come on, fellas. Yeah, all right. Come on. There we go. Yeah, l- let's hear y'all. All right, men, you listen with your ears. ears. Not a trick question. Good job. You listen with your ears. But women, y'all may not know this about yourselves, ladies, so listen to this too. Women listen with their eyes. We listen with our eyes. I know, we're just special. So men, when your woman dating, married, Whatever, when your woman is sharing her heart, man, if you make eye contact, she is going to be so in tune with you, it's going to be awesome. Women listen with their eyes. Where are my married men? Hey. Yay. All right. Married men, let me tell you, if you contribute emotionally, your woman is going to contribute physically. I call it intimacy ROI, return on investment. (laughs) If you invest, she's going to return. That's right. But men, you're saying, or some of you are questioning, why do I have to go first, Mm -hmm. right? If she would just get physical, then I'll show up emotionally, right? Or I can get emotional when we're there about to hit the physical intimacy part, right? But it's your job as a man to lead in all aspects of your family, It's your job to lead in all aspects, whether you like it or not. God has called you to be a leader, and leaders go first. That's good. Ephesians 5.23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. So men, be a leader and lead your wife. Amen to that. All right, where are my women at? All right, yeah. Okay, ladies, let me just give you a little tip for emotional intimacy. When you want to take some emotional layers off, give your man a heads up. Like, let him know that it's coming. Because otherwise, it's like handing him a fragile package without the sticker on it that says fragile, and he's not going to know how to handle it. He's not going to know how to handle it, so give him a heads up. Here's what we do practically. When I need an emotional quickie in the middle of the day, I will call Matt and I'll go, hey, do you have time to talk? And he's like, oh, signal. And then he's got a choice in that moment. Either he has time. (laughs) Code red. Code red. Code red. (laughs) Either he has time to receive my fragile package, or he'll say, hey, you know what? Let's talk later. I'm, I'm running short on time, but let's, let's reserve some time to talk later. But women, give him a heads up. That way, he's prepared to receive what you're about to hand him, okay? Now, Matt has gotten really good at that, receiving my fragile packages, but he has also gotten really good at not fixing my problem. 
Because ladies, sometimes we don't want to fix. We just want a little fanfare, right? Let's check out this video. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't try to see things. Right, ladies. It's not about the nail. It's not about the nail. I just need to listen to you. I just need you to listen to me, right? Well, guys, listen. In all seriousness, emotional. Intimacy is the glue that holds a relationship together. Think about it. It's the glue that holds our relationship together with the Father. Because when we allow our emotions to be unhindered with God, in vulnerability, he's like, I can work with that. I can work with vulnerability. Emotional intimacy is so critical. And listen, if you've struggled or you are struggling there, listen, we've been there. We understand. But can I encourage you, number one, get some help. Because your relationship needs that emotional connection to go next level. Not only did Matt and I experience that early on in our relationship, but there have been other times. Not only did we get help, but we also sought help from the great counselor. I love what the psalmist says. He says, search my heart, O God. Show me what's in there so that I can address it. If we, if we humble ourselves before God, say, God, we got a problem. Help us out. Help, help and show us what is hindering our ability to connect in the way that you've called us to. And you know, we serve a God who's not one of withhold. He shows up every single time. You guys stand to your feet, please. <clears throat> you know, as Christians in our faith walk is a series of peaks and valleys, right? And a lot of the times our relationship with God, not intentionally, but it may take the back, a back seat to something in your life, another relationship, right? Getting married is a pretty impactful thing. Having kids. Just life happens, and you find yourself sometimes in a place where you're like, something's going on here. Like, we're not right, or I'm not right with my parents. Something's going on between me and my dad, or me and my cousin, my brother, like my siblings. It's just not right. If you think about it, it's because we haven't gone here first. Yeah. It's easy to let her slip in in that spot in front of God, right? Because I love her, and God intended for us to be together. My kids, you know, with the, our lives just going all sorts of different ways. I used to spend so much time with God, but now I have to get the kids up, and we have to get them to school, and their base, weekends or baseball, and I find myself, man, it's been, how many days has it been since I spent time with God? Wow. And it hits you, you know, it hits you right in the face. You're like, man, you know what's awesome is God's always there. He's always there to, like, make it right. And he's like, you know, if you just come and sit on this bench, then I'll just slide right over beside you. If that's you this morning, can you just put your hand on your heart? 
maybe you've gotten something, something's taken into place. Your job, that happens a lot. It's happened to any, all of us. Just takes a priority over your time with God. Or your, your marriage, you know, for those of you who are married in here, your kids. If that's you, just put your hand on your heart. It's just so God can see you. He can see you and he says, I know, I see you, you recognize it and I recognize it. You know what? Come sit on this bench with me. Come sit down with me. We'll get this right. Because if you chase after me, then I'll fix all of that. I'll fix every other relationship, every other problem that you have, I'll fix it. And if you don't know about that relationship with God, if you've never prayed that prayer, if you don't understand that the reason we get that relationship with God is because Jesus died for us. The only reason we have the opportunity to sit at that bench is because he sent his son and he died for you. The Bible says that when Jesus died, the veil tore, granting us access to the greatest father that anyone has ever known. The best relationship of your life will be the one that you have with your father, your heavenly father. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes, if you've never accepted that relationship, if you've never acknowledged Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you didn't know that before today, I want to give you an opportunity to receive it. If that's you, we just shoot your hand up really quick so I can see you. You can put it right back down after you raise it. Just shoot it up so I can see you, so that God sees you. Thank you. And I want to pray for you this morning. I want to lead you in a prayer of salvation. And I also want to pray for those who put their hand on their heart, who want to reprioritize their relationships, to put God first. If every person would just say this with me, repeat it so you can hear it with your own ears. Say, Father God, Father God, I receive you today. I receive you today. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for sending your son. So that I can have a seat. So that I can have a seat. At your bench. At your bench. Knowing that you'll slide right over. Knowing that you'll slide right over. I accept your son. I accept your son. As a gift. As a gift. To me. To me. Today. Today. I prioritize you, God. I prioritize you, God. I put you first. I put you first. Above any other relationship. Above any other relationship. So that they'll all be blessed. So that they'll all be blessed. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I will serve you. I will serve you. Today, today and every day. And every day. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.